In the uh, various announcements that we have made, we have told about a book, a new book uh, last year, God's Forever Family. And uh, this book documents and details uh, the Jesus People movement uh, that swept across America and in some parts of the world. 1970, as Pastor Alson ably uh, ministered this morning, we tied on to that Jesus movement. The blessing that has been ours uh, came out of a number of dimensions uh, that we embraced uh, there in that movement. There are three specific things that I want to minister to tonight that are contained in this passage of scripture that are very simple and yet they're ingenious in their profound dimensions uh, that we have tied on to in our fellowship uh, has made us what we are. If we hold to those three simple elements, our future is secure. When I say these are profound, when I begin to name these, you're going to say, I've heard that before. It's not hearing that. It's doing that is what's going to make the difference. Acts 13, verse 1, guarantee for our future. Now, in the church that was in Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then having fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus, and when they arrived in Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. They also had John as their assistant. Now this sermon is a hallmark sermon because contained in the simple words that are there and contained in the words that I'm going to minister to you tonight is the key to the powerful ministry of God's releasing what he wants to do in planet earth through the church of Jesus Christ. And I want you to pay attention to what I'm saying because this is profound. What we're talking about tonight is a lay movement. Now when I say lay movement, I'm talking about a movement that is not driven by nor uh, centered upon a clergy or a trained professional ministry. There's a comment that's made in the scripture about the disciples of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's found in Acts chapter 4 verse 13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they uh, were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled, <coughs> excuse me, and they realized that they had been with Jesus. Now think about that for a moment because in this truth is a very profound element that governs the release of God's grace in what he wants to do. There was a couple left our church many years ago. And as they left our church, uh, the statement of the wife who was driving the agenda said, uh, I want to go to a church uh, where we have a professional minister who keeps regular office hours, uh, and I want to go to that church. In the process of time, they backslid. Uh, they divorced. Uh, some years later, the husband came back in uh, to the church. Uh, but she left and drove that agenda because... Uh, she did not see a professional clergyman talk about me. Now, when the Bible says that these were uh, ignorant and uh, 
they were uneducated or untrained men. The King James says that. It does not mean that these were stupid men. These were self-educated men. There's a difference between stupid and self-educated because the disciples learned by experience, and this is what they were observing. They saw the miraculous ministry, the grace of God is upon them, and they had the remark of the marvel of the grace of God that was upon them and said they were not religiously trained nor were they religiously uh, educated, uh, but they have, were connected with people. Hallelujah. So think with me for a moment. Uh, a lay movement. We're talking tonight about a spiritual validation. This spiritual validation came by observation, and it came by function. Uh, verse 1, uh, look there, because they were prophets uh, and they were teachers, uh, there besides Barnabas uh, and uh, Saul. Now this is a process. This lay movement is a process uh, that has made us what we are. To my knowledge, there's only three men in our fellowship that have formal uh, seminary training or Bible school. That's Kevin Foley, that is John Gooding, and that's myself. I don't know how many ministers we have at the present time out of the 2100 churches we have but to my knowledge this is the only formally trained ministers that we have and as concerning me i was almost destroyed by being educated and by being trained by the religious world so let's look at this for a moment because this is a well-documented process in matthews or acts rather Chapter 6, verse 3, it says, Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. And the saying, verse 5, Please the whole multitude. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. So in other words, what we have is the dynamic out of the congregations, men raised by the Spirit of God and the possibility seen of men being raised up, of others seeing that and seeing that Layman could rise to a place of ministry. Uh, that dynamic was involved, uh, and this is such a powerful, powerful dynamic uh, tonight. Leadership uh, is developed out of a congregation. In the book of Titus, chapter 1, verse 5, it says, For this reason I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are, uh, that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I I commanded you. So in other words, uh, from among those congregations, uh, there are people that are qualified uh, that have been raised up by the Spirit of God. Uh, and Paul says, I want you to appoint these uh, into uh, leadership and pastor ministry uh, from uh, among the congregation. The church was founded uh, by lay workers. The four apostles uh, that are very prominent were all fishermen. One of them was a tax collector. All of them are called into ministry from uh, uh, lay or secular employment, uh, and all of them are raised up uh, because this is the pattern uh, that our Lord Jesus Christ set in order, lay ministry. That means non-professional clergy, but people raised up from... Uh, the congregation, uh, and the Bible says that Jesus' pattern was set. The common people heard Jesus uh, gladly. Now, I've read these quotes before, and so if you're listening, I've heard that before. You're going to hear it again. A good quote ought to be like a good song. You ought to sing it over and over again. Listen to this quote. 
The Christian church was begun by laymen. The apostles were all laymen. It has ever since owed its best growth to the cooperation of laymen. The monks were lay orders. The Methodists won their greatest victories by lay preachers. Not only that, uh, but these laymen in every one of these three periods did their work uh, in spite of the clergy, uh, discouraged by the clergy, uh, and detested by the clergy. Listen to this quote, if you bear with me. On the other hand, it has been said that in, uh, in many places, laymen are more eager for evangelism than ministers. After all, the Old Testament prophets were laymen. Farmers called to service from between the handles of the plow, gathers of sycamore fruit, uh, and cupbearers uh, to kings. So think about that for a moment, uh, because here we have an interesting dimension. In a book, which I'm going to quote again, To the Ends of the Earth, you must read that book, Pastor. They make a very interesting statement. I went through it again the other day while preparing this sermon. And they make this statement, which is very profound, uh, which is why I say this ingenious dimension is here. It makes a comment because that book is a book that says how the Pentecostal movement has changed uh, the world, the, the shape of world Christianity. It makes this statement several times. Uh, that lay workers uh, speak the language of the streets. Think about that for a moment, uh, because what we have uh, is a profound uh, dimension. In that book, uh, it documents how in the early days from the Azusa Street uh, 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 revival and others, uh, that these people who were baptized with the Holy Spirit began to speak in tongues or give ecstatic utterances uh, they thought, because of the early days uh, and the book of Acts, uh, that they were receiving a foreign language, and indeed, in some cases, uh, foreigners did understand their language. Many of them spread all over the world on, on missionaries on their own, thinking that they could easily speak to the, these other people in languages. It was lay workers that spread out uh, all over the world on their own uh, that spread the Pentecostal movement even upset many missionary organizations uh, who were not spirit-filled uh, as they went in and began to share the wonderful baptism of the Holy Spirit, got their missionaries baptized with the Holy Spirit and speaking with other tongues uh, and ruined the whole operation uh, because uh, it was a lay movement, a powerful movement. The Pentecostal movement at its very essence is a lay movement. Secondly, I want to talk to you about the dignity uh, of the local church. The church tonight uh, is known as the Catholic Church. That doesn't mean the Roman Church. It means the Catholic Church or the universal church uh, that all believers saved, uh, washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, are members uh, of that church. But, if you want to make it real, you must make it local. In the Bible, when the seven churches of Revelation are addressed, they are addressed as the church in Ephesus, the church in Laodicea, the church in, uh, in uh, 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 Pergamos. So when you want to make it real, you have to make it local. Now let's bring it down to the church for a moment. I saw a young man the other day, I was watching, uh, you know, I, I watch people in conferences. It's, it's a trip to watch people, I tell you what. It... <laughs> I saw a chick walking by tonight, she's tatted down this eye. I mean, if you got it, you need to flaunt it, you know, this, from shoulder to wrist, uh, sleeveless blouse. Uh, I said, uh, it's a trip to watch people in church. There was a young man, he had a t-shirt. I'm not sure. I kept looking at him. I thought he might have been an islander. I'm not sure. It shows a palm tree and somebody climbing up that palm tree. Uh, and it said on that, back, uh, make it local. Okay, this is what I'm talking about tonight. Let's make it local here. <laughs> when 
the church is functioning, it has the dimensions uh, that we've read about uh, in the book of Acts chapter 13. See, the problem when we talk about the church, we fantasize about the ideal. I've heard sermons preached uh, uh, from Ephesians 5, 27. When the church is perfect, then Jesus will come for her. Well, it's going to be a long, long time, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Ephesians 5, 27, they get that, that he might uh, present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. And so that all has dimension. But when you look in the Scripture, here are these candlestick churches uh, in uh, Ephesus, uh, uh, in Pergamos, uh, in Laodicea, and lots of problems in those churches Jesus was talking about. When you talk about a perfect church, you look at the, the Corinthian church, the gifts of the Spirit flowed freely, uh, wonderful things were happening, uh, and these churches were something less uh, than perfect churches. Uh, but isn't it interesting uh, that candlestick churches uh, evolved uh, from this wonderful ministry of God's outpouring the Holy Spirit uh, and people preaching. Verse 1, the church in Antioch was a candlestick church that evolved. This church was an indigenous church. This church was fully functioning. This church was self-supporting. This church was self-governing. This church was self-propagating. But into that church, God was raising up his purpose to evangelize the world because disciples were being raised up uh, and they were raising up workers uh, and it mentions Simeon uh, and Lucius uh, and Manaean uh, there in addition to Barnabas uh, and uh, Paul uh, and they had authority to take the name of Jesus Christ uh, and to go forth uh, in the power of the Holy Spirit. Listen to Matthew 18 verse 20. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I'm there in the midst of them. Now think about that for a moment, uh, because Jesus says uh, we have uh, the authority uh, to use his name. Thank God for that. Can you say amen? It is not the name of the potter's house that's going to make success. Uh, it's not my name, your name, or anybody. It's the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, Hallelujah, that is going to win the day. Listen to this quote. Jesus said in John 14, verse 14, If you ask anything in my name, I'll do it. The Hebrew word for name is Shem. The root word for Shem is Neshem, which means a person's very breath, character, and unique personality. It is the essence of who someone is, in other words. Uh, when I pray in Jesus' name, uh, it is Jesus himself uh, who does uh, the praying. So let's think about that now because we're gathered tonight in the name of Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? And as we look at that for a moment, uh, Paul and Barnabas uh, went out of the Antioch church. This is a local church. Uh, has the dignity of having the name of Jesus Christ, and they went out with full authority. Well, they went, and the first place that we record, they're ministering and preaching the gospel to the leader that is there, and there's an old charismatic named Bar-Jesus that is there. He begins to oppose what is happening, but Paul has the name of Jesus Christ. That's what he's going by. They've laid hands upon him and Barnaba. They've committed them to represent them. They have the Holy Spirit that's going with them. And Paul fastens his eyes uh, on Bar Jesus and said, you full of the devil. You be blind for a season. And all of a sudden, uh, he's walking around, has to have somebody to know where he's leading. You know, where's the love in that, Pastor? That was love. Paul loved that leader because he's preaching the gospel. Uh, and uh, as he did that, uh, the full authority is there because he's ministering uh, in the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, and this is the secret uh, moving 
from a local church uh, with the conferral of the name of Jesus Christ representing that. I was very interested in uh, Joseph Luhan, who went into Soju, China. Now, I don't know uh, Joseph Luhan from a bar of soap. When we announced him last uh, conference, I couldn't tell you whether he could bit, hit his butt with both hands or not. But Pastor Wilcox, uh, w Wilson, uh, believed in him, and we said, okay, we're going to send him. We sent him. He lands in Soju. And uh, you know the story about the uh, supernatural guidance and so on. But uh, through that contact, they invited him in one of these little house churches to minister. Uh, this, this is an unspoiled fellowship. Thank God for that. They have no connection. A Baptist missionary win a number of years ago, witnessed to them, uh, taught them the basics uh, of the gospel, uh, and spontaneously the Holy Spirit uh, has been bringing forth 90 churches in Soju, some probably five to 10,000 believers, uh, 90 house churches are there, and so they're not spoiled by outside ministry. Uh, nobody's discovered them to spoil them yet. They invite him to speak in this house church, uh, and uh, Joseph Lujan is there, and he prays for the sick, uh, and somebody gets visibly and instantly healed, and immediately they do not have this in their fellowship. And so immediately the word goes out everywhere. Here's a man that prays for the sick, uh, and uh, rapidly we've sent a bunch of others in that pray for the sick too, amen. And so here we have... Uh, this wonderful dimension because in healing power, this is opening the door, immediately gives him validation. Remember what I said, the dynamic and the dignity of a local church, he's commissioned and sent out, and God's power goes with him. There's a book called Signs and Wonders. This book is a small book. We also, uh, they've sold it out, don't have any of these. Uh, but the, this book tells uh, why the Pentecostal church uh, is the fastest growing movement uh, in the world today. Worth your time to read that, Pastor, because that sets us up for what I want to preach on uh, in the next thing. So think about this uh, in the name of Jesus Christ. What does that mean? What that means is is a divine debit card. How many of you have a debit card? God deliver you. Amen. A divine debit card. What that means then is in Philippians 4, verse 19, Paul says, My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus, riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. So what this means then is all your needs. You need a lot tonight. Can you say amen? Every believer's here. Every pastor here. Every disciple. We need. Here's a divine resource. That divine resource in spiritual riches uh, is a reservoir of spiritual enablement uh, and grace. Uh, and the Bible says uh, this springs out of uh, the dignity of the local church. We were into the Jesus movement five years. We were planting churches, uh, and I'm, I'm thrilled with everything that's happening. It's a total puzzlement to me. It's beyond me. I'm not doing this. God's doing this. And five years in, suddenly I realized uh, what God is doing is he has restored dignity to the local church because I was a member of the, uh, of the uh, denomination trained by Bible school teachers uh, who were all failures that wanted to put that failure in us uh, and never ever even dreamed that out of a local church uh, you could send out workers uh, and plant churches. Uh, three years out, we planted our first church and it was, uh, as Pastor Olson said this morning, it was successful self-supporting in seven months. He wasn't lying, he just didn't know the truth, amen. He said six. Seven months self-supporting. We said, 
wow, man, that felt so good. Let's do this again. And rapid fire, we began to plant churches. And five years in, it finally dawned on me, God was giving dignity to the local church. I want to tell you, Pastor, you may not feel very important. I want to tell you, if you're functioning in the name of Jesus Christ, there is dignity beyond your belief. Angels in heaven look down at what God is doing. Thirdly, I want to talk to you about a world vision. I said there's three things in this book that are very prominent that stuck in my mind. All of these we embraced, which is a world vision. Now, this is a profound revelation. Many of you, you may never have been to a conference like this before. I want to tell you what you're seeing tonight is such a glorious and wonderful dimension. Would to God that everybody in the world were doing what we're doing, but they're not. Something has laid hold of us. and This is a vision for the world, and this is a fruit of a spiritual prominence. Listen to me for a moment. Why do people uh, and movements uh, uh, begin to engage various programs uh, and projects? Why do they do that? Some of these things that they're involved in, I read about what people do and say, what? Even a jackass would know better than that. Why do they do that? Because they know that if you're a Christian, you need to be busy doing about something, and so they create busy work, and their people are busy about various things, and that not to say that every project or program is wrong because some of these do good, but look with me and think with me for a moment uh, because we operate in a spiritual arena. We're not operating in a secular arena. The moment that we begin to name the name of Jesus Christ, the moment we surrender to God and allow the Holy Spirit to begin to move, we then are moved into, as children of God, born again, baptized with the Holy Spirit, we are in a spiritual arena. And in that spiritual arena, we either will be moved by God or we will be moved by God the devil and exploited by the devil. What this means is that there must be a demonstration of the spirit or a work of the flesh. A work of the flesh means that you're just doing busy work. You're involved in some kind of project. You're selling candy or you're out on the street selling flowers or you're involved in something. You either will be involved in a demonstration of the spirit or you'll be involved in some kind of project uh, trying to raise money uh, for uh, 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 some kind of little uh, activity. And I said in the earlier si uh, sermon that Stephen Cassio tells me that he gets calls and they say, uh, we've got a wonderful cash program for you. That if you'll uh, tie on here, your people can sell candy and you can raise money. And he said, no, we don't do that. You don't do that. You're not interested? No, we're not Well. You need to get involved in it. Well, what do you do? He says, we take offerings from our people. Isn't that a unique, uh, a unique project? So here we have uh, either a demonstration of the Spirit or a work of the flesh. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4, listen, Pastor. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and verse 4, the Bible says, uh, and my speech and my preaching... Uh, was not with the persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that the, your faith should not stand in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. Now here's tremendous insight. I said to you, a world vision. Now, this tells us then that we're going to be moved out of our sphere into different dimensions uh, and the moment that you enter into this uh, realm the devil is going to conflict with you and he's going to try to derail you he's going to oppose you why do you think that the first place that Paul and Barnabas went to Bar Jesus was there uh, near uh, the ruler of that area it's because the devil 
also is at work in life. So let's think for a moment as we look at this, uh, because in verse 2, the Bible said, the Holy Spirit said. Did you hear what I said? The Holy Spirit said. So how are we to look at that? Well, this very apparently, if you have any kind of interpretation skills at all, that they were seeking a Holy Spirit manifestation. I wonder, Pastor, are you seeking a Holy Spirit manifestation in your church? Obviously, they were fasting and they were praying because they want to know what God wants them to do. And the Bible says the Holy Spirit said. So this business of a world vision means that we're going to have to come to grips with what is the mind of the Spirit tonight? This book, To the Ends of the Earth, worth your time reading, is an absolute, uh, absolute must for you, Pastor. The book is To the Ends of the Earth, and it's how Pentecostalism has changed the shape of world Christianity. In that book, it says, when the Holy Spirit comes in, a missionary spirit comes in. Now, focus with me about what I'm going to say. The key to reaching this world is a supernatural dimension, and prominent in that is going to be healing. Listen very carefully to what I'm going to say. When I was in Bible school, we were in a class called the Divine Healing Class. We're there, and an old teacher came by that was in the early days of that movement. He, I saw him. He listened there, what was being said, uh, divine healing movement. He poked his head around. He said, uh, we believe that, but we don't do that anymore. And he went on his way. That's interesting. See, you can believe in without doing it. It can be a doctrine, but a doctrine is not going to accomplish it. Miracle healing is the key to this world in which we live. Some years ago, one of our workers was down in Nogales, uh, Arizona, and he was working in Nogales, Mexico also. A man called him on the phone whose name is Argemero Figuerio. He said, I'm a setup man for crusades for more Cerullo. And he says, this bull ring over here on the Mexican side, if you rent that bull ring for four nights, I'll come and do a miracle crusade for you. Our worker said, fine. Rented that bull ring, a dimension that he'd never seen. This man goes in. This man preaches to people for salvation. Hundreds respond to the altar call for healing. He has them lay their hands uh, on their bodies. He has them pray a mass prayer for healing, and miracles respond everywhere. Testimonies. First night, this is glorious. He called me and said, this is tremendous what God's doing here. Second night, same thing, wonderful miracles of God. Third night, wonderful miracles of God. The fourth day, he came and said, I'm leaving, to, and uh, uh, you're going to do the crusade tonight. The pastor said, I can't, I can't do that, Chris. You do exactly what I did. You'll see miracles. This man, not knowing whatever else to do, there's no way to get out of this now. He did that, and to his astonishment, miracles everywhere, and so he became our crusade man. Amen. Listen to what I'm saying. Now, the difficulty was he had a bit of pride about him, and so he was uh, our one-star miracle healer. But as, see, as time goes on, people who uh, are hungry for God and people who are inquisitive and who, people who want to see God move uh, begin to inquire more. But that dimension was triggered, and we began to investigate, uh, and that dimension of miracle heaving now has permeated our entire fellowship. Think back of the reports you've heard this week. Every single report is given miracles, miracle, miracle, miracle. What's that all about? That's what God is doing. Can you say amen? Because 
because that is the key to world evangelism. I picked up a book some years ago called The Filipino Spirit World. In teaching a, an adult Bible class recently, and I can't even remember it all. I do so much, I can't remember. But I remembered that book. I went and got it. Never read it. Went and got it. And I got a tremendous insight. Uh, when the Catholics came into the Philippine Islands, they were Catholics, uh, missionaries also, uh, uh, army and also, traders. Uh, they made the Filipinos Catholic. However, they are just cultural Catholics. What that means is the vast majority of them, they go to Mass, they belong to the Catholic Church, they're involved in it, they have some kind of thought about eternity, but there's another part of their life which the Catholics have no solution to, and this is a middle dimension. They were faithful in all that they did, but when the Catholics uh, had disease, uh, when the Catholics needed deliverance from demons, uh, when the Catholics need uh, to break curses, uh, when the Catholics need blessing, uh, they didn't go to the priests, uh, they went to the whack whack doctors uh, and the diviners uh, and neighborhood practitioners. Uh, and so they're simply cultural Catholics. You'll never break into that kind of a culture with this doctrine. We've all seen that. But the thing that peels back that cover and opens them is the reality of the Spirit of God moving in supernatural power, baptizing them in the Holy Ghost and bringing answer to their prayer, healing their bodies, give them deliverance from curses, uh, and bring blessing upon their lives. Uh, and this is true not only in the Philippines, uh, but it's also true in numbers of nations. It's true in South Africa and other places because the key is uh, the supernatural power of God, which is the key to world vision. So let's think about that for a moment. In Romans 15, verse 18, this is why Paul wrote these words. For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me, in word and deed to make the Gentiles obedient, in mighty signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about to Illyricum I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. So think about that for a moment, because... Here's the devil's diversion in Christianity today. I read a year or so ago a, a tremendous quote that nails this. It says, what's happened to Christianity is Christianity has, Christianity has moved from a God who heals and delivers to a religion that preaches how to understand God. Think about what I've just said. Christianity has moved from a God who saves, heals, and delivers to preaching how to understand God and that's left out entirely. It's just simply become a doctrine. That's what we believe, but we don't do it. So here's the challenge that we have tonight. As we're here... This also, this dimension, taps into financial blessing. This is God coming on the scene in these areas uh, and the challenge that we have tonight uh, in the future. I said this is a hallmark sermon, three dimensions. That dimension is a lay movement. That dimension is a dignity of the local church. Uh, and that dignity is a world vision uh, that is tied in uh, with the supernatural power of God. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 20. This is our challenge. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but it is in power. How many of you believe that? How many of you know Zechariah 4, 6? Not by his might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Yes, we believe that. We're Pentecostal. Yes, amen. Everywhere 
God is working today with these dimensions, and he's confirming the word with signs following. So encouraging to me to hear these reports because I'm hearing the every place I have the privilege of preaching in conference, every place I go, we're hearing uh, cancer heal, uh, demons cast out, people delivered from the diseases of the hour, hearing this everywhere because God wants the world reached, but it will only be reached by supernatural power. One miracle is better than $10,000 in a newspaper. Can you say amen? Over and over and over again. One miracle. One person that receives a miracle from God. Light it up. Light it up like a strobe light. Hallelujah. I was in uh, McAllen, Texas. Uh, and as I was in McAllen, Texas, uh, there was a woman caught me as I'm coming in, headed for the platform, said, Pastor, you don't know me. You're in the Mexico City Crusade. I, uh, I, I, years ago, I was in the Mexico City Crusade. I wanted you to pray for my father in proxy. Now, I don't generally do that. I want living bodies where I'm praying for it. From time to time, people come. If you did that, you'd, you'd be 40 hours even to get out of the building. But I really don't. I want people that would bring. She said, would you pray for my father? He's dying of cancer. He has stage 4 cancer. No hope. Uh, I pulled a Kleenex out of my pocket, put it in her hand. I prayed over that said, go put that on your father and pray for her. She caught me. She said, I was in that Mexico City crusade. I did what you said, and I put it on my father. My father is an American veteran. He went to the Veterans Hospital, and the Veterans Hospital said, there is no trace of cancer in your body. <laughs> Hallelujah. We have a man in our congregation who was up visiting in California, and he brought this report to me recently. He was up in, in California, and uh, he said a man caught him up there. If I understand correctly, he was attending Herb Ruby's church. And this man came to me and said, uh, I want you to tell Pastor Mitchell that Pastor Ruby brought me to the San Jose Crusade. I had stage 3 cancer. And he brought me to the, 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 the uh, San Jose. It was a rally. It wasn't a healing. And he brought me, in, and I remember her bringing him, asking me if I'd pray for that man. And he said, I want you to tell Pastor Mitchell I'm totally healed. No, but I'm playing the drums. He's filled with life. Tell Pastor Mitchell that. Hallelujah. That's God. Can you say amen? That's the key. Say, why are you telling us this, Pastor? I'm telling you this because I ministered for many years. We all had a bottle of water on our pulpit. It's the old four square way. You anoint him with oil, pray the prayer of faith. I never saw a single person heal. Who knows how many people I put oil on, never saw them heal. There's a difference in thinking about it in a doctrine and pressing into God. Say, God, I want to have that, and I want you to give to me the key and the understanding. We're going to do a crusade very recently. The weeks of headway in Oceanside, California. Many of you who are in the and many of you who are in the western part region, if you possibly can come to that crusade. Here's the reason I'm telling you that is because you can do anything that I can do. When we had this man who was our crusade man, we all believed that this is a special gift that this man has. And that's what brought uh, that power. When I broke into that and I discovered it is not any gift that I have. There are the gifts of healing. I know there are. But I do not have that gift of healing. When I broke into that, I realized it is not the gift of healing. It is simply believing God. And there's some simple dynamics that can be used that help people release their faith. Uh, and the minute I saw that, Every pastor, every worker I talked to, I was eager to tell them, this is a dynamic that you can get into. You see, what I'm saying is that when our crusade man, when our crusade man was doing that, 
we then begin to break in and we discovered we can all do that. And that's why I'm preaching this tonight is that the world arena, I don't care where you go, I do crusades of people suffering in various kinds of disease, various kinds of difficulty. They're under doctor's treatment. They've spent thousands of dollars. They're at the end of their rope, but they come to a crusade because they're desperate. The world is filled with those people, and they will come, and you can do this if you lay hold of God and learn the dynamics. A man came into today, said, can I... Can I come and see? Uh, can I come to that? I said, that's fine. Come and watch what happens. As you watch what happens, uh, then you can see uh, and your faith will be built up. Uh, and the Bible says, uh, God, uh, then they preached everywhere, the Lord working with them uh, with signs following. God bearing them witness, the Bible said, and confirming the word uh, with signs uh, and with wonders uh, and with gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. I want every head bowed in this auditorium.